when I was a kid, I loved to go to science museums. I know you're probably shocked that your nerdy chemistry teacher loved science museums. Truly astounding. But I did. My favorite experiment were the giant plasma balls. Here we had like a giant glass sphere that seemed to hold on to lightning, which is crazy. If you touched the glass sphere, the purple bands of plasma somehow find your hand. It's crazy. What's going on there? Well, it turns out that your body becomes the way to complete an electrical circuit when you touch it. And so the electrons actually pass through your body that make up this plasma. Fun fact, after you touch this giant glass sphere for a while, you can go touch your friend and you'll shock them, which I did often because I guess I'm a jerk in addition to being a science nerd. But I digress. The important part is that this glass sphere is actually very similar to the experiment that'll let us first discover the electron, a subatomic particle. That is, a particle even smaller than an atom. Let's take a look at how we discovered this electron. Let's begin by reviewing our lesson objectives. First, we'll introduce Dalton's model of the atom. Then we'll introduce the cathode ray experiment. And lastly, we'll unveil the first subatomic particle ever discovered. The first thing you should know is that everything around us is made of atoms. So this stack of pennies that you see on the left or any old object you see in your room, if you zoom in, you'll see that it's made of little small parts we call atoms. Here represented by these gray spheres stacked together on the right. So everything is made of atoms. One of the first researchers to propose a specific idea of atoms was John Dalton. And in the 1800s, he said atoms looked pretty much like this, a solid sphere, no parts at all. So imagine basically a billiard ball, but they came in different versions. So you had a bunch of different billiard balls. And here are his original drawings that represent 20 different atoms, 20 different elements, 20 different building blocks of the world around us. So each element is a different atom, and that's how we get different things around us. Dalton said we could combine these together in groups of two or three or more, and when we combine these different atoms, we get compounds. So compounds are a combination of different atoms. So there you have it. That's Dalton's atom. And the main thing I want you to remember is that Dalton says atoms have no parts. Another way to say that, atoms are indivisible, just one solid chunk. And we can't break anything off from them. Well, another scientist put this to the test. His name was J.J. Thompson. And he took a look at something called a cathode ray tube. Here's a cathode ray tube. Let's walk through its parts. So here you have this little valve. And that's a valve that allows the air to be pumped out of our tube, shown in green. Within the tube, we have some wires and they're connected to a battery. That battery leads to plates within our tube. So on the right hand side, we have a positively charged plate. And on the left hand side, we have a negatively charged plate because they're attached to batteries. Here's the thing, a negatively charged plate, it's called a cathode in this case. So that cathode is shooting things off of it, represented by those red arrows. And so those were called cathode rays because they came off of the cathode. All right, all very well and good. What in the world does this have to do with our atom? Great question. Well, at the time, scientists wondered, what are these rays made of? Are they made of some element? What's going on here? Well, J.J. Thompson had a special cathode ray tube with some attachments on it that helped him test out what these were made of. So here's a picture of an actual cathode ray tube that you could do this experiment with. In the middle, you'll notice these charged plates have been added and those are to bend the rays. So they can bend the cathode rays and study what they're made of. Meanwhile, on the far right side, this guy is actually a screen to observe where the rays hit. So the rays will shoot out from the left-hand side, potentially be bent by those plates and observed on the screen. Here's a schematic of the same device. Again, let's kind of go through it piece by piece. On the far left, we have the cathode ray generator. Basically, this is what we looked at originally, where you have the negative and positive plates, and it makes the cathode ray. And then on the right-hand side is this addition to test what those are made of. And here you see two plates, a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. 
Notice that the cathode ray is bending downwards away from the negatively charged plate. To understand this result, you need to know a basic chemistry fact that was known at the time. Like charges repel. What that means is the negative charge on the plate is repelling the cathode rays, which means they too must be negative. So Thomson inferred that the ray was made of negatively charged particles. The second thing he observed was how much the rays bent in this contraption. That allowed him to estimate the mass of the particles. And when he calculated it, he was shocked. The particles were 1,000 times smaller than the smallest atom. And so, if something smaller than atoms exists, that means that atoms aren't the smallest thing in the world. That means that atoms have parts. Thomson had discovered the electron. So, this led immediately to a question. If atoms have parts, well, how are they arranged? How are electrons arranged in atoms? Thomson proposed the plum pudding model of the atom. And it looked like this. Instead of a solid sphere without parts, we now suddenly had parts. Notice this atom has little electrons in a yellowish color there smeared out throughout the sphere, which is said to be positively charged. So this was his proposal for how the atom appeared. We're going to take a look at how this was tested in later lessons, but it is true that all atoms contain electrons and that electrons are negatively charged. We have a somewhat direct experience of electrons in our everyday life when we see lightning. Lightning is an electrical current. It's the flowing of electrons from the sky to the ground. And when that happens, it creates very high temperatures and something called a plasma, which is what we actually see. But lightning is caused by the flow of electrons. We also can observe a similar phenomenon in our lightning ball that we discussed at the very beginning of the lesson. This plasma ball has streams of electrons coming from the sphere in the center to touch the person's fingers on the edge of the glass. This too is a way we can sort of experience what electrons are like.